this morning comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 9, verses 1 through 9. Jesus took Peter, James, and John and led them up a high mountain to be alone. As the men watched, Jesus' appearance was transformed and his clothes became dazzling white, far whiter than any earthly bleach could make them. Then Elijah and Moses appeared and began talking with Jesus. Peter exclaimed, Rabbi, it's wonderful of for us to be here. Let's make three shelters as memorials. One for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He said this because he didn't really know what else to say. They were all terrified. And then a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, this is my dearly loved son. Listen to him. And suddenly when they looked around, Moses and Elijah were gone, and they saw only Jesus with them. As they went back down the mountain, he told them not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. And our second reading is from the Gospel of John. Chapter 14, verses 12 to 21 and 25 to 27. And this takes place later. These are among the things that Jesus is telling his disciples when he's having his last meal on earth with them the day before he came on the cross. I assure you, that whoever believes in me will do the works that I do. They will do even greater works than these because I am going to the Father. I will do whatever you ask for in my name so that the Father can be glorified in the Son. When you ask for anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. I will ask the Father and he will send another companion who will be with you forever. This companion is the spirit of truth, whom the world can't receive because it neither sees him nor recognizes him. But you know him because he lives with you and will be with you. I won't leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Soon the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Because I live, you will live too. On that day you will know that I am in the Father and you are in me and you. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them loves me. Whoever loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love them and reveal myself to them. I have spoken these things to you while I am with you. The companion, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything, and will remind you of everything I told you. Peace be with you. My peace give to you, not as the world gives. Don't be troubled or afraid. And just two verses from Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. So dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. And then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. This is the word of the Lord. We're halfway through the Gospel of Mark when we come to this story of Jesus taking three of his disciples up on a mountain with him. This is literally going to be a mountaintop experience for them. Peter, James, and John are the inner circle of disciples. They're destined to be future leaders for the church. Sometimes they get to go just a few steps further in what they witness and experience with Jesus. So on this day, 
They go with him up the mountain, and they see things they did not expect to see, things they can barely believe. First, Jesus begins to change before their very eyes. Jesus is the light of the world, and that light begins to glow with an intensity and a purity that their senses could hardly perceive. But the Spirit allows them to see it. I like the way this translation puts it when it says that it's, his clothes are whiter than any earthly bleach could ever make them. Some older translations say that Jesus was transfigured before them, and that's why we call this Transfiguration Sunday. But in this translation we read this morning, it says he was transformed. I want to tell you what's really happening here. There's a heavy veil from earth that is being lifted just a little. Like when Paul wrote that sometimes now we see in a mirror dimly, but in heaven we'll see as Jesus truly is. Most of the time we see things just as they appear to us on earth. But for just a moment, Peter and James and John got to see Jesus as he really is, not on earth, but as he appears in heaven. The veil was lifted and they got just a glimpse of their friend in all of his glory. The second thing that happened is two more figures appeared beside Jesus. Peter, James, and John were allowed the privilege of recognizing them. these were Moses and Elijah. Moses represented all of the law. Elijah recognized as the greatest of the prophets. And Jesus came to fulfill the law, and Elijah, was said, would return before the Messiah came. So these are two important figures to appear beside him. Well, Peter was so overwhelmed by this all-star past talking to the teacher whom he loved, he didn't know what to say. So he and Peter stuck his foot in his mouth and said the dumb thing. Lord, it's good that we're here. We'll build three shrines for you. Some translations say shelters. So I don't know if he's talking about a temple or pitching a tent. But in any case, this is not why Jesus brought them up on the mountain with him. Just one chapter before this, Peter has a divine inspiration, recognizes that Jesus is indeed the Messiah, the one they have all been waiting for for generations. But he doesn't understand what Jesus' earthly mission is all about. And now Peter wants to put up a monument to this occasion, perhaps build a home so they can all stay on that mountaintop forever. The mountaintop experiences of our lives were never intended to be a place to remain. They're gifts. So that we can feel the bond that we have with our Creator and with our Lord and Savior. The time that Jesus spent in prayer with His Father God were always times to be strengthened for the work to be done when He came back down the mountain to the crowds, to His disciples waiting below. When we're given special times to acknowledge who Jesus is in our lives. Those moments are meant to encourage us and empower us to come back to the world around us and do the work that God has called us to do. There are significant moments that we can look back on and cherish for the rest of our lives. They may give us meaning and purpose that feeds us for a very long time, but they're just moments along the way. Today we will celebrate baptism for Chloe and for Case. And for them, and their parents and grandparents and all the extended family in these first two rows. These are high holy moments when we recognize God's claim on these young lives and acknowledge that God has a plan and a purpose for them. God designed each of them with unique personalities and will bless them with unique talents and gifts. We affirm that God will always be with them. And we promise to raise them within a covenant with God that God makes with all of his people. So this is a precious moment, but it will pass. And Chloe might remember some of today. The case is going to need others to do his remembering for him. 
Here's the important thing about these sacred moments that God gives us along the way. Someone needs to write them down, to talk about them, to share something of that experience, to save the mementos, to take pictures, so that we can cherish that experience and let it strengthen us again on the down the road. Save for the moment. And let them continue to be important and inform our lives in the future. So I'm going to encourage Case and Chloe's family to help them remember their baptism day and talk about it in the future. It will be easy to remember being the day after Valentine's Day. And that's a good way to talk to them about God's love for them. Help them remember as they grow up what this day was all about. For the past few weeks, we've been talking about this call to follow Jesus, to be disciples, to be the church, and to be in mission. Case and Chloe are invited to be part of that along with all the rest of us. In their baptism, you have an opportunity to make a commitment to help them along their way. Because they can't do it all by themselves, and neither can you. This is something we've been learning as I've shared some insights from a book called Sailboat Church. It's by Joan Gray. We've been learning that rowboat Christians and rowboat churches try to do God's work all by themselves, and it doesn't work very well. Instead, we're trying to learn to be a sailboat church, to know that we're meant to be partners with Christ, doing our share as directed and empowered by the Holy Spirit. We've learned that through prayer, worship, fellowship, Bible study, and other means, we can hoist our sails to catch the wind of the Holy Spirit and let it empower us to sail wherever it chooses to take us. We were reminded last week that ships were meant to sail, that we come to the harbor for repairs and supplies and refreshment along the way. There will always be assignments from God that take us back out into the world to do God's will, just as Jesus and his disciples had come back down from their mountaintop experience. So today I want to talk a little bit about the life of a sailor. Gray writes that Christian sailing is a way of life that involves a committed, personal relationship with Jesus Christ. We sail because God uh, calls us to be sailors. And sailing requires trusting in Jesus and letting Him have control. Because we cannot fix ourselves, we cannot fix our world, we cannot fix our church or our community or anything else by ourselves. We're invited to be part of what God is already doing. We work together within that relationship with Christ. And it's a relationship that relies on trust, just as all relationships do. Trusting God is an intentional choice. Once we take that step, then our discipleship training can begin. Disciple trains not just to gain knowledge, but to become like the rabbi, like the teacher. Peter, James, and John and the other disciples followed Jesus. They were students learning not just his stories or which scriptures he quoted. They observed their teacher's habits, the way he treated others, the faith in his prayer and the compassion he had for the people others ignored. Their goal was to become like Jesus, and so is ours. We come to the scriptures, the Bible class, and to worship not just to learn about the kingdom of God, but to learn how to live in it and how to invite others to join us. Grace says discipleship is about identity with Christ and commitment to his way of life. Can you claim that identity as a baptized child of God, as a disciple of Jesus? Because it's not just enough to know about Jesus or even the right things about Jesus. It's all about being in a relationship with Jesus and living out that relationship in the world. In that relationship, we are like dependent children. So I want you to consider the little brother and big sister that we're going to baptize today. Case is an infant. And he has to depend on his mom and dad and other helpers pretty much everything. 
Chloe is older. There are things she can do for herself. But she still needs mom and dad and others for things she can't do yet. Instinctively, these two young ones trust the adults in their lives for the things that they need. And in the same way, there are many things in the life of faith that we can do, but not everything. We have to trust God for the things that we need. It's not just that we're holding on to God for dear life sometimes. It's that we trust God to hold on to us tightly, like a parent holds on to a child's hand in the crowd, even when we're distracted and we would have let go. When you come to this point of abiding that relationship, trusting God to hold on to us, then we open up to receive the Holy Spirit so that God might also dwell in us. A part of the sacrament of baptism today will include praying for the Holy Spirit to be part of Case and Chloe's lives. But this isn't just a one-time invitation. We can invite the Holy Spirit to make his home in us as often as we need to be renewed in that spiritual relationship. That's what Jesus told his disciples. He reminded them that he and the Father were one and invited them into that union. He promised that the Holy Spirit would be sent to guide them in this life. And he promised that the relationship would continue beyond this life on earth into eternity. He offered them his peace beyond anything the world could give. Finally, while we live yet in this world, as sailors or disciples, we need to put on the full armor of God, as Paul wrote to the Ephesians. We do this by putting Jesus front and center like a belt of truth. Just as a belt keeps everything in place, focusing on Jesus as the way, the truth, and the life helps keep our perspective in place. Next is the breastplate of right living. When champion in old times needed help to put his breastplate on it was big and heavy. And we need help to live as God desires. And we put on the good news of peace as if we were putting on the shoes to go out and tell others the good news about Jesus. We carry a shield of faith. Not just how we feel about God or the circumstances on around us. That shield is something intentional. It's a choice that we make to turn away from our doubts and our fears and instead to put our faith, our trust in the promises of God. That shield is what we stand behind. We wear the helmet of salvation, remembering that Jesus' very name means God saves. And God indeed saves us through the sacrifice of Jesus. It's a done deal. No one can hold guilt or shame over our heads. Jesus has already washed it away. We carry with us God's word as if it were a sword that cuts through the devil's tricks, the temptations that surround us, the despair of the world that brings us hope. The more we read, study, and surround ourselves with God's word and scripture, even memorizing a verse here and there, the more the Spirit can use that to work within us and transform us into who God created us to be. Around all of this, we need to wrap ourselves in prayer, keeping the lines of communication open for God to work in and through us. These are the things that keep us fit to sail with Christ so that we can be, as Paul wrote, a living and holy sacrifice, not copying the ways of this world, but in true worship, be transformed and made new to live in ways that honor and please God. As we worship today, inviting the Holy Spirit into Case and Chloe's lives, inviting the Spirit to continue working in each of our lives, may we be transformed to become more like Jesus and in the process to catch a glimpse of the glory that Christ shares with us. You are called to sail with Christ, empowered by this spirit. And our next hymn is in the little supplements. It's number 2153. The tune is familiar even if the words are not.
coming forward to assist in that. Let's come on over here. I'm going to put these down for a minute. Gospel of Matthew. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. There are also these words written by Paul to the Ephesians. There is one body, one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. And in Acts it says, this promise is for you and for your children, for all who are far away, everyone whom the Lord our God Obeying the word of our Lord Jesus and confident in his promises, we baptize those whom God has called. In baptism, God claims us and seals us to show that we belong to God. God frees us from sin and death, uniting us with Jesus Christ in his death and resurrection. By water, the Holy Spirit, we are made members of the church, the body of Christ, and joined to Christ's ministry of love peace, and justice. So let us remember the joy from baptism as we celebrate this sacrament. Thank you. 